So we're talking about the future of intervention. And when we look at where things are going to go in the future, it's always a good idea to understand what we're doing now and also where we've come from. And uh, Dave Volinsky gave you a great talk yesterday about medical illustration. Well, this is also some of the first medical illustration. Uh, the, from a tomb in Egypt, it shows surgical instruments and it shows birthing chairs. And as you can see from the Monty Python skit, we haven't really uh, advanced very much in that, uh, in that realm. But surgery has been going on for also tens of thousands of years. We see evidence from, the, from archaeology of surgical procedures that were done on patients and they lived afterwards. And so when we are trying to think about where it is that we might be going in the future, it's important to understand that we have been intervening in our healthcare for a very, very long time. And this is a graph, but I figured you guys could handle it. You've got data from uh, other points so far today. This is from Hans Rosling's wonderful software program called Gapminder, where you can plot out one part of the world's uh, data against another part. In this case, we're looking at income per person, GDP per capita, which is inflation adjusted. So I'm going to go through a few slides. Keep in mind that these are all pegged to kind of the same time. And life expectancy. So back in 1800, we hadn't advanced that far beyond uh, what you saw on the walls of the Egyptian tomb. What we could do in terms of healthcare in a lot of cases was a triumph of public health. It was mostly about clean water and sanitation. And the more clean water and the more sanitation you got, the longer you would live. And we, would, we can see this when we go up 100 years. And things are starting to spread out. As Europe, represented in the blue and Americas, start to move ahead because of the money associated quality of life followed GDP per capita. And we ended up with a line that was pretty predictive of when your society moves forward and you manage to get more clean water and sanitation, your life expectancy goes up. But what you'll notice is it's really interesting, even with that, this is a little over 100 years ago, there's very few countries that have a life expectancy that's over 50 even with the things that were going on. So we're only 100 years out from that. We move to 1950, and something interesting has happened. So this is the post-World War II. The world's been through horrible paroxysms, but we've also seen the rise of technology. We have vaccines. We are starting to get antibiotics. And we've seen that we've moved off this line that is just about public health, and we've jumped up in terms of technology how we're moving the entire line up. We get to 2012, and we've got a whole nother line. And in a lot of ways, this is the rise of modern medicine. And you look at that 50-year life expectancy, and while 100 years ago there were almost no countries that had a life expectancy of over 50, now there's almost no countries that have a life expectancy below 50. And this is largely because we have been bringing in lots of new technologies. The most important of which is vaccines. They don't cause autism, people. This is just insane. <laughs> but if we can't defend a technology like this that has saved so many lives against an anti-science backlash, how are we going to be able to bring out a lot of these other technologies that we're talking about into the global population? And so this is a really interesting lesson, I think, that we need to learn as a scientific community and as one to really talk about how to be an advocate for a real uh, important um, technology that we've got, because this is a really essential one. Also, what happened is antibiotics. We did a workshop before this where we sort of postulated what does the world look like in a post-antibiotic world? And that was a pretty scary world that we were talking about. The kinds of interventions I'm mostly going to talk about, however, are in the world of surgery and imaging. So we, in these last 
50 years or so, have really been making huge strides in both the kinds of surgical therapies we can provide and the sort of imaging that we can do to support it. And so this is my favorite surgical robot. And we've also got some very, very high-tech imaging that we can do. And this is the business end of the robot. And if you want to go play with it, you get to only play with it today. It's only, uh, it has to go and do other things tomorrow. But uh, you will find that when you sit down at the console, the motion of your hand is exactly duplicated by the motion of the instrument on the inside. So that means you can place uh, the instrument between the ribs rather than cracking open the chest and be able to work on the inside of the heart and that you can also do all sorts of different kinds of surgeries through very small incisions. There's a new generation of this robot that is out now. For, I'm afraid we don't have it out for you to look at, um, but maybe next year. And the, the key thing about this one that is different from the one that's been out before is really much more the ability to be able to swing around and work in different places within the abdomen. So it's more suited towards things like uh, general surgery. But more and more hospitals are looking like this. I said, when you're sitting at the console and you make a motion and it's duplicated exactly on the inside, that's probably the most important thing that I said there because we walk through, we put that motion through a digital step. A lot of these technologies that we're talking about are about being able to look at digital streams of data and being able to make decisions based on that. And we're digitizing surgery. So we give the patient a surgery with a small incision, but we also digitize surgery. And in a way, when we're thinking about uh, how it is that we're going to fit robotics and how it is that we're going to fit intervention into this greater world, I gave you a little bit of perspective about what happened with uh, life expectancy and income per capita. But this is BMI and income per capita. And so while we've been doing pretty well, that line there is overweight. And so above 25, the average BMI of most of those developed countries is sitting above the overweight line. We've had these wonderful triumphs of modern medicine and modern technology, and now we've gotten to this point where we're also reaping some of the unintended consequences of it. John Matheson showed you a portion of this, but you know, modern medicine has not all been a resounding success. And part of this is because none of the things that we're doing exist in isolation. This is a fairly complicated uh, interrelationship, but I tend to think about medicine and medical care in terms of three big pillars that are increasingly starting to overlap. One is in prevention and wellness, and you've heard about this quite a bit over the last couple of days. This is where we're really wanting to move towards not needing to intervene. Another big area is in diagnostics, figuring out when we do need to intervene or whether we don't need to intervene early on. And then the last, the area that I sit in, is in interventions. But we can't work in any of the areas in interventions in isolation. We can't assume that we can create a technology there without paying attention to the rest of the entire ecosystem. Mainly because we're the end of this chain. When prevention fails, this is when we start to intervene. And when diagnostics finds us things very, very late, we do big interventions. So when surgery is found, when, when cancer is found very late, we have a big tumor excision with a large reconstruction. But as diagnostics starts to move us into finding things earlier and earlier, we start to be able to intervene when things are smaller. And the interventions come down in their acuity. So to give you an example of some of the diagnostics that are coming down or, and why we want to have these diagnostics early is stage matters. So this is a gastric cancer uh, staging chart. And if we find gastric cancer at stage one, 
we can do a pretty good job. We can go in, we can get it out, and people move on. If we find it at stage four, there's no intervention that I can do right now, not surgical, not drug, nothing, in order to alter this, the progression of this disease. And so the acuity of our interventions is going to be, we, it is going to be a function of how well we're doing diagnosis and how early we're doing diagnosis. So this is one of my favorite pictures because dogs have been trained to smell lung cancer. They're smelling exhaled biomarkers. And they've been trained to say this is a cancer patient and this is not, and then they can get very predictive. And for a while, we didn't know what it was that they were smelling. But there are a large number of companies out there now who are working really hard to be able to track those biomarkers and do some real diagnostics. Owlstone, who cut their teeth in military detection of organic compounds, is now using field asymmetric ion mobility spectroscopy, or FAMES, to detect and separate out all of the components in an exhaled breath and be able to detect not just lung cancer, but also asthma and be able to look at the response to treatment of certain drugs, being able to look at the biomarkers in, in that exhaled breath. And that's the size of the chip. This is portable. It's not a big laboratory somewhere. There's also groups like Pacific Edge, and they're looking at genetic signature detection. Right now, they have one product out there, which is bladder, so detection of bladder cancer, and it's an at-home test. But not just detection, but prognosis, so that we don't overtreat. We're not treating the ones that don't need to be treated, but are, tre but are rising in acuity the ones that are likely to progress really quickly. And so a lot of the work that they're doing is really looking at prognostic indicators and where we have to dial up the urgency. We heard Google X is going to unleash nanobots all over inside in order to, it, it, it sort of sounded to me a little bit like they were a little bunch of like English bobby policemen where they'd be like roaming around in the bloodstream and uh, glomming on to a cancer cell and saying, we found this here miscreant making trouble and uh, bring it up to the sensors. I'm sure we'll get a better description of it than that, but so far that seems to be what it's about. And then of course a group that's really near and dear to my heart because they came out of the Singularity University group, uh, Miraculous, that's looking at microRNA. And so when we come out of diagnostics, this is really gonna change the way we're doing surgery if we get everything smaller and smaller. And now we look into things like at the intersection of diagnostics and interventions where we start to get to high acuity data, where we're seeing really fancy imaging. And I think there's some very disruptive technologies in here around the, around the world of imaging agents. So this is out of the Netherlands. It's a, folate, it's a folate receptor binder that binds to some kinds of ovarian cancer. And rather than being able to see it uh, in the kind of the pinky view, you can see it in bright contrast. And so also with fluorescent imaging that allows you to see where the blood vessels are running, but also if you selectively clamp one of those vessels, see where in the kidney you have uh, decrease the blood supply. These are the sorts of things that we do to, can use to target in on these much smaller cancers and be able to work in these confined spaces. This is a sentinel node, which is the first lymph node generally that's out of a tumor. So you inject a dye around the tumor and it follows through the lymphatic system to that first lymph node. And because we can see through tissue with near-infrared, we can see it glowing down below the surface, and it can guide the surgeon to find the lymph node that has the best positive predictive value or negative predictive value of cancer. If you take that lymph node out and you section it really finely, if it's the first one that comes out from the tumor, if you don't find cancer in it, then there's a 97% chance that it hasn't gone anywhere else in the body, and you can stop and you don't have to take out all of the rest of the lymph nodes. And so it's both diagnostics and imaging agents where we're seeing huge agents of change that are going to shift around what we're doing in intervention wildly. 
I also get excited about what we can do in regenerative medicine and using high-tech prosthetics. When I say cancer is going to get small, cancer is going to get brightly lit, we can take it out when it's only the size of a pea and we're not going to do big reconstructive surgeries anymore, people say, oh, well, we're not going to need surgical robots anymore. And I actually think of us as shifting more into the spare parts business at this point. Because as we get rid of cancer, we unmask all of the issues of us continuing to sag and tear and wear out. And the replacement of these parts starts to be something where we want to do it as maintenance. And so if we're growing new parts, you got to put them in. And Tony Atala, oh, that disappeared. That was a picture of Tony Atala, for some reason it disappeared, uh, showing off one of his, uh, his lab-grown kidneys. Now, we don't have functional lab-grown kidneys yet, but when we do, you're not going to want a big incision in order to have them put in. And so one of the nice things that is about robotics, and that step that I was talking about, that digitization step, is that we can change the scale that we're operating at. We can work down at these very, very fine levels where we can do sensory surgery, where we can operate on the back of the eye with comfortable motion of the surgeon's hand, but nano microscopic or even nanoscopic motion of the instruments, the therapeutic instruments. And this gets really interesting when we start looking at some of the new technologies that are coming down in terms of new implants. And this is a model with the rice grains of a new pacemaker. And why it's so small is not because of anything about the electrode part of it, but because it's not carrying its battery with it anymore. It comes out of a group at Stanford that's been looking at midfield power transfer. So we've not been able to recharge or, or charge stimulators that are deep down inside the body, and so they all get big batteries implanted with them. They can now couple this and wirelessly deliver power, which means we start to have little tiny implants. And I've got just the robot to go and put those in all the little places that we're going to want to have them. But looking for what we're going to do in intervention is going to be so important to understand how it is that we're intervening and understanding this. And so we go from also this regenerative medicine and high-tech implants into AI expert systems and big data. I mentioned we're digitizing surgery. We're understanding the way surgery is being done. And we're able to also peek over the shoulder of the surgeon and have a platform into which we can bring a lot of decision-making support. And so everyone's been showing you Watson. It is a natural language processing. I can imagine a surgeon sitting at a console saying, hey, have you ever seen anything that looks quite like that? And the robot actually can, or the, the, the AI system can actually look at that because they're seeing what the surgeon's seeing. We've got a digital intermediary. And so we are being able to pipe this out to these decision-making decision engines. And so while we tend to think of robotics as largely the mechanics of moving things around and near-term things will be new instruments, different ways in which we can bring instruments in through a single port, long-term, the future of this kind of intervention is driven by diagnostics, it's driven by the technologies that are coming out of regenerative medicine and AI. And it will be robotics that is this platform that allows us to install them, but also allows us to do a lot of this interpretation. So thank you very much.